So, so uh, thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm honored to uh, have been invited here to come and give you a talk um, as we get closer to celebrating uh, Cesar Chavez Day on, on this weekend. If you have not participated in celebrating this event, I, I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, you will find that there are several marches that are dedicated uh, to this movement, to this event. And uh, in the Q&A, we can talk more about that. What I intend to do is I intend to provide you a brief history of why we, we are making an effort to make uh, uh, Cesar Chavez a, a federal holiday. Um, and I think that uh, once you hear this brief history, that I hope that you will also right, jump on the wagon with us to secure that endeavor. Um, so my, yeah, my name is Jesse Esparza and um, my, my good friend and my colleague, Dr. Galvan, uh, is very prolific in bringing speakers to campus and I was glad to be a part of it as well. So I wanna thank Dr. Galvan and his colleagues who brought me here. I wanna thank you, the students who have come here as well. I wanna thank Students Without Borders. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful organization and it's, it's a powerful name uh, and I really recognize that. I also wanna thank uh, Kristen Johnson from the Office of Intercultural Center for her sponsorship. And so um, this is the title of my talk. It's called More Than a Huelga. Uh, Huelga is Spanish for strike. Uh, and it's a brief history of the United Farm Workers Movement uh, and a brief history also and a brief look into the struggle in the field then and in the Q&A, I hope. Uh, we could talk a little bit about that also at the present time. What I intend to do is during the talk is I'm going to provide you this brief history. But in the background, uh, we'll be playing a video. Uh, no audio, just, just a video. Uh, and that video we can share with you so that you can see it's only two, about 26 minutes long. My talk isn't that long. The video is, is about 26 minutes. And we'll just play that and we'll just let it play as I'm giving you this conversation. Uh, and so it's not timed with the video. The video is just going to play in the background in lieu of a PowerPoint and in lieu of images. So I hope you're okay with that. We'll share that with you as well so that you can have it and view it on your own. The United Farm Workers Union, or the UFW as I'll call it for the rest of this piece, by 1962 had become the largest Mexican-American, among the largest Mexican-American unions in the United States. Its mission was to protect the rights of field workers and other laborers responsible for harvesting America's foods. One of the co-founders of the UFW was Cesar Chavez, a decorated World War II veteran who grew up extremely poor and had no more than an eighth grade education. Chavez belonged to a migrant family, and from a very early age, he understood clearly the plight of workers. Also a co-founder of this organization was Dolores Huerta, who worked briefly as an elementary school teacher and who saw that her students, many of them children of farm workers themselves, were living in extreme poverty without enough food to eat or other basic necessities. To help them, she established the Stockton chapter, Stockton, California, the Stockton chapter of the Community Service Organization, or the CSO, which worked not only to improve the social and economic conditions for farm workers, but to fight the discrimination they encountered as well. Founded in the early 1950s by other activists such as Fred Ross, Saul Alinsky, and Edward Roybal, the CSO was designed to combat against discrimination in housing, in employment, and in education. It also attempted to register Mexican Americans to vote who were disenfranchised uh, since before the turn of the 20th century uh, politically. It would be as members of the CEO of the CSO that Huerta and Chavez would come to know each other and where they would first encounter pushback from a very strong, entrenched conservative Republican Party establishment that accused both Chavez and Huerta of being communists as a way to silence them and also as a way to disallow them or the CSO to register Mexican Americans for voting. It was here also that both Chavez and Huerta would align themselves with the Democratic Party who they believe right, held the most bargaining power for agricultural workers in California and then ultimately throughout the United States. It would not be until 1965, however, that the UFW gained national attention. It was that year that it initiated the Delano Grape Strike. This was a critical turning point in the development of the growing Chicano movement. In Delano, California in September of 1965, 
the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, or the AWOC, a union formed by Filipino workers under the leadership of Larry Itliong, struck against growers for better worker rights. Having suffered massive resistance and limited success, the AWOC teamed up with the UFW to form a new organization called the National Farm Workers Association, and this organization became the leading group to launch the strike. The problems for fuel workers were many, but typically they included low wages, exhaustive work hours, corporal punishment, arbitrary firings, exposure to danger, dangerous chemicals, no medical benefits, no child care availability, no child labor protection laws, unlivable accommodations, and zero political representation. So, in 1965, the national boycott begins. The targets were the largest agricultural industries in the U.S. Groups like the grape giant D. Giorgio Corp, along with Shenley Company and s and Fine Foods. The strategy was simple. Hit them where it hurts them the most, in their pockets. To accomplish this, workers engaged in nonviolent forms of protest called a strike. Yet while these were acts of civil disobedience, workers were subjected to verbal and physical attacks throughout their peaceful demonstrations. Opposition by growers varied, but they all saw the strike as bad for business, and so they used their unlimited resources to weaken solidarity. For example, they often engaged in arbitrarily firing workers for participating in the strike or for being a known or, watch my fingers, suspected member of the union. Growers also denied jobs to those who again participated in the strike or who again were known or suspected members of the union. They also blacklisted activists and then shared that list with newspaper companies, law enforcement agencies, and with other employers so as to deny persons the opportunity to find work anywhere else. Many times growers hired a mixture of native-born and foreign-born workers to ensure, again, a lack of solidarity. Or they brought in strike breakers, right? pejoratively known as scabs. These were workers who were hungry for jobs, who had no loyalty to the union or to the strike. Certainly the preferred methods by growers to end the strike, to end this strike, uh, however, were fear, intimidation, and violence against strikers who were threatened, beaten, illegally surveilled, over-policed, and mass incarcerated. In 1966, Chavez Huerta and the UFW set out with 100 farm workers to begin a 300-mile pilgrimage from Delano, California to the state capital in Sacramento. And after 25 days, their numbers swelled from hundreds to an army of thousands. They also be began to get national attention and expose the plight of farm workers. Helping to galvanize national attention was the use of the iconic image of La Virgen de Guadalupe, the indigenous mother of Christ who was a manifest combination of the Virgin Mary and Tonantzin, a Mesoamerican deity and mother of all gods. At the head of the pilgrimage was an enormous banner adorned with La Virgen's image. In fact, this was Chavez's and Huerta's and the UFW's. Uh, this was why their marches and demonstrations looked more like religious pilgrimage, pilgrimages, because they were always adorned with flags and banners of La Virgen. Carrying this religious symbol was significant for several reasons. First, La Virgen is considered a patron saint of Mexico and of Mexican Americans and came to represent not only a religious image, but a nationalistic icon as well. Second, the image echoed nonviolent tactics and passive resistance, making Chavez, Huerta, and the UFW the face of nonviolent protest. And third, right, the image symbolized a growing artistic expression and production generated during the Chicano movement, which included an explosion in the visual and performing arts, an explosion in literature such as poetry, novels, speeches, an explosion in print media, and an explosion also in music. The California pilgrimage would inspire similar events across the nation. In Texas in 1966, activists would lead a march from the Rio Grande Valley, that's South Texas, all the way to Austin to protest farmer worker ex or farm worker exploitation. Known as La Marcha, the purpose of this march was to petition Texas Governor John Connolly to, to call a special session to pass a state minimum wage bill and to pass also legislation that gave unions the right to bargain on behalf of workers. To accomplish this, activists embarked on a 400-mile journey from South Texas to Austin. Although their requests were denied, media coverage of the march helped to make Texans aware of the unfair labor practices and energize others to join the movement for higher wages 
and social justice. In the Midwest and in the Pacific Northwest, activists also took to the streets and began organizing for social justice. In Wisconsin, Milwaukee became a critical site for activism as workers both in urban Milwaukee and in the rural parts of the state were already uh, intimately connected to migration from Texas, formed Obreros Unidos, a labor union designed to protect agricultural workers. They also formed the United Migrant Opportunity Services, an organization dedicated to war on poverty by providing migrant opportunities to continue their activism first started in the Lone Star State. In other places throughout the Midwest, like Chicago, activists formed Mujeres Latinas en Acción. This was an organization that included Puerto Rican women and that provided social services to the families of field workers. In other states, however, and it must be mentioned, the farm workers movement had a different impact. In Arizona, for example, it frightened work growers and enforced state lawmakers to pass legislation, making it more difficult to unionize, hold strikes, and engage in boycotts. So in some places you have the same happening and in other places you have massive, massive resistance. The struggle in the fields grew alongside an explosion of culture and artistic expression that came to define the Chicano movement. These expressions, as I mentioned earlier, included the visual and performing arts, print media, literature, poetry, novels, and music. Emerging out of the farm workers movement was performance art with social justice as its theme in something called Teatro Campesino. This was farm workers' theater that infused culture into the struggle with music, songs, dance, and guerrilla-style theatrical performances. These performances helped sustain the long days and nights of the picket lines. It was founded by playwright and producer Luis Valdez, uh, and Teatro Campesino will come to change the way activists saw themselves within the movement and changed also the way others saw the struggle of field workers. Also growing out of this movement was a newspaper called El Malcriado, the malcontent. This was muckraking journalism founded by the UFW and used to keep the people informed as well as to organize them. El Marqueado was a media forum that used passive resistance to engage in civil acts of disobedience. It also right, became, uh, it also visualized the movement and it also signaled again, as I mentioned before, the growth of print media within the civil rights struggle. While the, strike, while the strike was a civil act of disobedience and while strikers were married to the method of nonviolence, the farm worker movement was ripe with violence, in fact. Much of it was external and perpetrated against farm workers, but at times, some of that violence was internal. Certainly, the fear of additional beatings and frustrations with law enforcement's inability and at times unwillingness to apprehend offenders forced many within the movement to respond with violence. This response, however, caused Chavez to engage in a 25-day fast in penance for farm workers, right, what he called moral problems, and right, to dissuade talks of continued violence. The year was 1968. The fast was punishing, and it quickly took its toll on Chavez. Hundreds came to him and pleaded with him to break it, but Chavez refused until he was absolutely convinced that the movement was committed to the method of nonviolence. Ultimately, however, Chavez did break his fast, but not before some 4,000 people came to plead with him to do so, among them persons like Robert Kennedy. Fasting, in fact, was considered Chavez's greatest organizing and protesting tool. It was this method specifically that drew support from leaders of the black civil rights movement like the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. While the fast was successful, 1968 would be a problematic year for Chavez. That year, Robert Kennedy would be shot and killed by a young Palestinian who opposed his pro-Israel position. Kennedy's death meant that Chavez and the UFW would have to face off against a staunch Republican leadership, Nixon and Reagan, who had ties to growers and agribusinesses and who opposed the farm workers' efforts. It would be these men that helped pass Proposition 22. This was legislation that was anti-union, anti-immigrant, and anti-farm worker. The national boycott lasted five years from 1965 to 1970. And in the end, the UFW defeated the giant agricultural firms and forced them to pay their workers livable wages and forced them to provide them benefits as well. This victory represented the most successful consumer boycott in US history as the contract signed between the UFW and growers was the largest contract ever agreed upon. 
Still, problems existed as growers continued to deny workers adequate pay or they delayed in their efforts to do so. As such, the struggle in the fields continued. In 1979, for example, Chavez and the UFW held a rally in Houston, Texas at the Guadalupe Catholic Church, and they came there to garner more support for future boycotts. He was well received and strongly supported by like-minded activists from throughout the city. In the end, the farm worker movement would inspire the larger Chicano movement in several ways. First, it symbolized the hardships of farm workers whose working conditions represented the most difficult and lowest paid in the U.S. Second, it inspired Chicanos from across the nation to also fight for political rights, economic uplift, and social justice. The struggle in the fields also contributed to the aesthetic of the Chicano movement, especially with the adoption of the Huelga flag or the strike flag. This is now a, a memorable image of the farm worker movement. For those that are unfamiliar, the Huelga flag consists of a black eagle on a red flag. This is a combination that captures the spirit of revolution embodied in the struggle, by the struggle in the fields. The red and black colors quoted the, the traditional colors of the Mexican Revolution of 1910, and the flag symbolized the, myth, the mythical Aztec past, a central tenet of the Chicano movement's identification with the indigenous ancestry of Mexican Americans. Moreover, the black eagle, eagle resembles an inverted pyramid, which pays homage to the pyramids of ancient Tenochtitlan and Mesoamerica. Second, the models Viva la Causa and Si Se Puede both became rallying cries of the farm workers movement and came also to permeate into other areas of the multiple civil rights movement occurring across the nation. Third and equally important, the struggle in the fields also introduced the nation to strong active Chicanas who were central to the farm worker movement, women like Dolores Huerta, co-founder of the UFW, and Ellen Chavez, spouse to Cesar Chavez. These Chicanas, like others that would follow, challenged and criticized the ethnic nationalism of the Chicano movement for being too patriarchal and lacking a sophisticated inclusion of both sexes equally, since many women were often marginalized and excluded from leadership positions. In the UFW, however, women were central to the movement and critical components to its successes. Lastly, Chavez and the UFW knew early what other groups and activists of the Chicano movement would learn later, that young activists, young people, the youth, students in particular, were critical to the successes of the movement. This is why Chavez began campaigning at colleges and universities for support. Cutting edge, ahead of the curve. Ultimately, however, the farm worker movement would slow and eventually wane, a decline that was again in line with the weakening of the Chicano movement. While the decline of both the farm worker and the Chicano movement is difficult to determine, many historians of the period agree that several factors helped contribute to its end, among them including police violence and surveillance by FBI agents, which discouraged many from engaging in political action, a challenge by a growing conservatism and a backlash against civil rights movement, as well as a rise of the political right, and then also economic uplift, as many farm workers and Chicano activists became part of the political establishment they once criticized. In 1993, Chavez passed away. Buried with him was a short handle hole and a wooden eagle. Delivering his eulogy at the funeral was Dolores Huerta. In 2008, then presidential candidate Barack Obama called for the establishment of a Cesar Chavez national holiday to be honored on his birthday of March 31st, an effort initially led by the chair of the Hispanic Congressional Caucus, Representative Joe Baca, a Democrat of California. Today, Cesar Chavez Day is not a federal holiday, but a holiday recognized on a state-by-state -state basis. And even then, states have been less forthcoming in defining the parameters of Cesar Chavez Day. Certainly, establishing Cesar Chavez as a national holiday would satisfy a large segment of the national population, but we must also acknowledge that it would simultaneously anger another large segment of the national population, as not everyone agrees that there should exist a holiday of a poor Mexican-American field worker with no more than an eighth grade education. I don't have to explain the politics behind this, only say that voting on this issue would undoubtedly become another battle site in the cultural wars currently taking place across the country. Still, to make Cesar Chavez, a, uh, Cesar Chavez Day a national holiday will confirm that the experiences of Latinos, activists, agricultural workers, and poor communities are, I put that in quotes, are historically significant. 
Moreover, it sends a powerful message that Latinos, activists, agricultural workers, and poor communities should be recognized as genuine history makers, a message, as I have mentioned before in previous visits, that is necessary to offset the perception that Latinos, activists, agricultural workers, and poor communities are an ahistorical people and a drain on American society. <clears throat> yes, sir. What do you think it's not discussed anymore? You know, like going through history classes, it's not really a subject that is talked about a lot. What do you think is that? Like, so I, if I hear you right, I think you're asking why this topic isn't discussed in the classroom. Correct. Is, it, is that right? Yes. And I, I would say that it's, it's several things, right? I think that one is perhaps uh, there is not enough dedication in our books to these kinds of subjects, right? And that speaks to a larger issue of what legislators believe is worthy of teaching, right? And so we have sort of rethink the way we think about what is worthy and what isn't worthy. In my estimation, it's all worthy, right? Uh, also, right, we sort of live in a paradigm where when we think about race in America, we think between black and white. And so that other groups kind of fall to the parameters. We have to reframe the way we think about race in America too, uh, and class and gender and so forth so that we bring those groups from the periphery to the center. We should all be in the center. In fact, there should be no periphery and everything is the center. And so until we begin to think about those kinds of things, we will continue to, to experience the same kinds of problems, right? That there isn't enough on Mexican American in these books or enough of those kinds of discussions in the classroom. But again, right, this is why your professors and the offices do what they do, is to provide these spaces because we know that it, is, it isn't happening enough in the classroom. So we provide these kinds of things, not to tax y'all to come here, not to force you to come here, but to have conversations about things that you might not have time to discuss in a classroom or read in a book. So, that, I mean, I, I've added these kinds of short spaces. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that, that like there were names of movements that happened here in Texas. Can you just kind of give me some of those names because I didn't get a lot of them down. Was it the Umbrero Unidos? So those are happening, uh, Umbrero Unidos are organizations that are happening outside of California and outside of Texas. I mentioned those because I was trying to give the, uh, trying to make it clear that what's happening in Southern California, right, isn't unique to Southern California. And while that gets most of the attention, and, and it should, right, it's sort of a, a microcosm of what is happening across the country. And it's happening in other communities as well. I mean, you can look at, at, at black uh, field workers in Mississippi who are organizing and marching, right, and bringing, right, you know, sort of uh, questioning the power structures. So it's happening across the nation, like in the Midwest, like in the Pacific Northwest, like in the Southeast, and it's happening across different kinds of communities as well. So there's not just Chavez in the 1960s that is engaged in this. This is Chavez gets most of the attention. Uh, and so, but I was just making the point that it becomes something that, that in, in inspires the entire country. So what's happening is Wisconsin, Wisconsin sort of seems to be the second home for the house, right? People leaving out of Texas migrate to Wisconsin for work opportunities. And so you'll have a sizable Texas po population there. Uh, and they come from every community, brown, black, white, you name it. But it's mostly Mexican Texans who go up there. And so when they go up there, they bring the activism that they were exp exposed to in South Texas, and they bring it to Wisconsin. And I'm not making the case that nothing existed in Wisconsin before Texas Mexicans got there. What I'm saying is, is that it was amplified once they got there. And they began to form organizations and they begin to march as well and really become a self-sustaining autonomous community. Disenfranchised, segregated in the workplace, segregated residentially, uh, uh, victims to harassment, intimidation, surveillance, but they insulated themselves, right, provided for themselves, and then began to agitate for change. So Wisconsin of all places, right, you have Mexican Americans engaging in civil rights. I mean, Mexican Americans are everywhere. I mean, 1902, we're in, we're in New York City, right, so we're everywhere. And so, yeah, it's in places like Wisconsin, which traditionally, right, we probably don't think about Wisconsin when we think about a, a, a Chicano diaspora, right? So this movement, this spread of Mexican-Americanism, yeah, but it happened in, in the heartland in places like Wisconsin. And, it, and it's not just in the fields. Think about the factories, Mexican-Americans are there too. Uh, I forget what you call them, but it's where you, the 
the poultry factories, the poultry plants, places like that, the cheese factories, places like that, the cows and the dairy factories and things like that. Is there still a bunch of migrants that are yeah, and so, right, I mean, this is a story of migrant workers. Uh, and so Texas would also, you know, sort of, there would be a massive exodus of people who leave Texas and they'll go to Blackville, Arkansas, or they'll go to Eugene, Oregon, wherever the work takes them. And they'll be there, they'll be seasonal workers, and they'll be there. And, and so uh, these workers are some of the most exploited people, not just in the nation, but across the planet, uh, working for starving wages from sunup to sundown. Uh, and really treated, it, 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 you know, I mean, the behavior and the experiences they suffer is very criminal. Uh, and it's difficult to challenge, it's difficult to say something, because you can be fired. And so, um, uh, in the 1960s, uh, most of those persons uh, were working class peoples uh, who were living, you know, to, to survive that week. I mean, you sort of think about the way we live in our society today, where we buy in excess, where we, you know, we, we, we buy multiple things, like I have, multiple cologne bottles and multiple belts and multiple shoes and I buy in excess. I don't need those things. Right here in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, some of these communities are buying things that they need to not die that week. I want you to sort of think about it that way. So they are a very exploitable population, an expendable population. Uh, and so yeah, they're tied to it as well. Now there's a thing about this movement. Uh, this movement here by Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, the UFW is a movement that is designed to protect native-born workers. Just to be clear about that. Because what's happening also, and it had been happening since the 1940s, what's happening also is the United States and Mexico are engaged in a, in a program where Mexico is exporting workers to come and fill in the 40s, right, uh, uh, labor shortages caused by wartime stresses. You have people leaving the fields for the factories or leaving the fields to go to the front lines and it produces massive, massive labor shortages in the 1940s. And so what happens is Mexico and the U.S. engage in this deal where they bring workers over to come and fill those labor shortages, and it'll be these men, come from every state in Mexico, it'll be these men who grow America's food and who feed Americans at home and who produce the food for American soldiers and the allies of American soldiers abroad. Well, that was only a wartime measure. That was supposed to last only through the war. <coughs> Turns out it would last all the way into the 1960s, 1964, I think is it's canceled. And it will last that long because growers would see the bracero workers, that's what they were called, they were called bracero workers, would see them as a far more exploitable population. Pay them less. You don't have to satisfy the contracts. We'll call IMS, send them back, all those kinds of things. And so these workers from Mexico were problematic for Cesar Chavez and the UMW because they were replacement workers. And so Cesar Chavez and the UMW were very clear and the Bracero program, sure, because of the inhumane treatment of workers, but also because, right, it's an obstacle in our efforts to try to secure wages for these persons, right, for native-born people. It's a very, very complicated story. <coughs> yes, sir? Is this movement still going on today? Absolutely, right? The struggle in the field is real, it's alive and well. The struggle continues. There are laws that are in place. There is better supervision of these agriculture firms who in the 50s and 60s were untouched. These are some of the most powerful industries in the nation. They dictate foreign policy and domestic policy, uh, but there's an effort now to really, uh, and there's an effort now to really begin to right, keep them in line, but the problems continue. The long work hours, the low pay, the lack of benefits, and those kinds of things. There's also the problem of uh, sexual molestation and sexual violence against female workers. That's a male-heavy industry, but women are there too and have been there since the beginning. And many of those women, right, often fall prey, you know, to, to those kinds of unfortunate, unthinkable, and very evil kinds of experiences. Uh, and that's a problem too. Uh, there's a wonderful documentary, it's called, excuse me, I'm gonna use this word, it's called Raping the Fields, that talks specifically about the struggle of female workers in those places. Uh, who find themselves in a different kind of like unspeakable experience. But the struggle is real. Um, you know, and I'm glad you asked that because you know one of the things that I often like to tell people is that you know you sort of think about the food that you're eating. Like when you leave here you go to Wendy's or someplace right? and you bite into that burger. Right? I mean hands grew that food. Hands harvest that. Someone is bent over for hours 
pulling at that and washing that and preparing that. So you become sort of, a, I hope, a conscious eater, right? And you acknowledge where your food comes from. I'm not asking you to change your eating habits, eat what you're going to eat. But I'm asking you to think about where your food comes from uh, because you know, those are humans who do that. And it's persons, I mean, who are down on the block and who have found themselves right, in a very, very difficult position that's almost impossible to get out of. Abject poverty, I mean, the, the hopelessness, it's oppressive. The hopelessness is, is, is oppressive, and, and it can really be, I mean, it, it causes all kinds of mental problems and emotional problems. It's just be conscious eaters when you bite into that burger and eat that pizza. Anything and everything you eat is coming from the hands of these workers. Yes? Yeah, in fact, uh, so California has a sizable Asian population, and since before, around the turn of the 20th century, uh, the Filipino population, you know, you saw this massive explosion of the Filipino population uh, into places like California. They would be imported. Men would be imported to come and work in the agricultural industries. Women would be imported to come and work in the medical industries as nurses, right, trained for, for nursing schools and things like that. And so, but it was in fact the, the Filipino community that initiated that movement in California. They were the ones who first struck against the growers. They were being paid bad wages, and they struck for, for better wages. When, when organizations and unions go on strike, they go on strike as a last measure, right? They don't strike first. They actually try to use dialogue, right? A strike is the last resort. And so what you do is you try to sit down with management and right, you share the complaints, but you don't just complain, you then also offer a list of right, sort of recommendations to improve the overall work experience. Well, the Filipino community and the workers had tried that for several times. And when all that fails, because they would fail, right, then they go on strike, a passive, right, nonviolent form of protest, a civil right, a civil act of disobedience. And the response would be swift. Or, or growers and, and, or, and, and employers hate unions, and this, this country has a history of really coming down hard on unions. Uh, and so um, the community struck for, for, for better wages. As I was telling you, unions strike for a multitude of things, but they normally strike for better wages, better work hours, and safer working conditions is what they normally strike for. Uh, and so yeah, it was actually the Filipino movement that started this, uh, and it's unfortunate. I mean, I mentioned it in my paper, but that wasn't the, the bulk of my discussion. It's unfortunate that they that, that effort has sort of fallen into the shadows of Chavez in the UFW. I mean, I've done right, what I had a conversation with this gentleman about earlier about right, sort of putting people in the periphery. I put the Filipinos in the periphery, so it's not an easy fix. But yeah, it's just it's that's that's exactly how that begun there. And they stayed part of the movement. They were there, and they, they just became they were a smaller group. They were absorbed by by Chavez, uh, and uh, they Chavez became the the face of the movement. And it goes also to, to, to say something about how we see leaders in the civil rights movement because the Lord was there too. The Lord's Wecker was there as well. And uh, we often mention Chavez first. I try to do it in my paper. In my talk, I try to mention Wecker first. But again, right, it's sort of this very sort of male-centered uh, and, uh, you know, sort of male perspective. And so we have to think about that as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you talk a little bit about, more about and how long it took for workers to reap the benefits right of the movement? You know, I don't know. It, that, that's difficult, too. I know that the strike lasted five years. I don't know, in fact, I, after that, I don't know how long it took for the benefits to begin to roll in. My, my understanding is that that was scattered and uneven. <coughs> and so that in some places that happened quick, in other places it did not, uh, mainly because of the lack of oversight. It's one thing to have the law, it's another thing to enforce it. But I couldn't give you a definite answer as to when it began to happen. Uh, only that after five years, everyone came to the table uh, and because you know, the movement was successful, right? This strike against the great companies, that happened across the nation. I mean, persons would be in Chicago and in, other, in, other, in Pennsylvania, and they go, they wouldn't strike in the fields where no one would see. They wouldn't strike in the fields because when they did that, Right? Law enforcement would come out and beat the people, arrest the people, scatter the people. So what they wanted to do is they wanted the whole nation to watch. And then they went and they struck against grocery companies. Right? Now, I don't know what kind of grocery companies existed, but I would say places like H-E-B and Aldi and 
you know, food town. They struck against them and says, right, if you're going to sell their product, then we're going to strike against you and we're going to hurt the grocery chain. That's, that's how you do it. It's an indirect strike, an indirect strike against the, the growers, right, to really get them to begin to, to, to force them to come to the table and begin to, right, uh, bargain. Do we have any other questions? We have time. Yeah, so Houston has always been sort of a hotbed of activism. In 1966, when the, when the pilgrimage was happening from Delano to Sacramento, uh, Houstonians and other persons from throughout the state uh, all met in South Texas, and in 66, they marched up, right, by another 100 miles, they marched up into Austin and had a huge rally in Austin. And then in 1979, Chavez again, right, because of these continued problems, because of the delay, Chavez would come to Houston. He would actually be invited to come to Houston, and he would speak to the clergy persons there. Chavez was a very sort of religious and spiritual person, and he saw the church uh, as a powerful ally in the movement. Um, and it was tied into his own pacifism and, and, and sort of, a, you know, sort of a method of nonviolence. But he, he was at the church. The Guadalupe Church is one of the eldest, uh, oldest uh, churches there in Houston, for Mexican American, a cherished institution. Uh, a cherished institution. Uh, and so he came there. He gave he gave a speech there at, at the church service, uh, and people rallied, and they began to try to organize the second boycott. Uh, but you have federal laws that are running interference, the anti-union law. Uh, with Prop 22, and then you have the anti-boycott uh, uh, law, and it was those kinds of laws at the state level and at the federal level that really began to um, discourage activists from participating. Uh, they'd be arrested for those kinds of things. So. Do you know what year the anti-union law is? That for the state of Texas? Yeah, it was. A, it was. A, it would emerge in California first, and then we copycat laws. Uh, don't quote me on this, but I want to say it's 19, 1977. Please don't quote me on that. No, I'm just trying to get it. Okay. No, it's after the five year. It's after the five year. <coughs> they come together first, okay. then the massive resistance mounts up again with the with the Reagan governorship and then with the Nixon administration. It mounts up again. Okay. Yes. Um, during the government classes, I had learned La Raza Unida was a political party that emerged in 1965, but it was just during that period. I know that the 1960s was a time for a lot of civil rights movements, which now I believe that Texas is one of the uh, most, um, wor the worst states for unions and the worst states for also I feel like we go into choosing two political parties, Democrats or Republicans, and we don't have another option for that. What would you say uh, was the, the way that people organized to have a third option and not just two options for everybody else like we do have now? Like I feel like we do today just to pick into two and we don't have enough organization so we can bring some other options for uh, the minority that we have here in Texas. Yeah, uh, so there have been several efforts, uh, in fact several times, to sort of move past a two-party system. It's difficult to do. Uh, that I know of, right, you, the, 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 one of the largest and, and somewhat successful efforts to move past the two-party system was uh, with the populist party, the People's Party, which was among right one of the early political organizations to be very inclusive of really anybody, women, men, you know, brown men, black men, so forth. Um, but then you know there was problems with that, uh, and in fact there was also efforts to right sort of remove that organization. You mentioned the Raso Unido Party, and you know in fact they had a convention in Texas. Uh, I think in 72, and then they had another one in 74. I think the 74 one was in Houston again, right? Houston sort of being a hotbed of Chicano activism. Uh, and in fact, right, the Rasmina party would have uh, candidates. They would run a series of candidates. Uh, and the Rasmina formed because of the displeasure of both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Now in the 70s, most Mexican Americans, not all, but 
most Mexican Americans identify with the Democratic Party in terms of principle, ideology, and if they could vote, and if they were voting, they would vote Democrat or at least support Democratic candidates. Not all, but most. Uh, and but even them, right? Members who joined, who formed Raza Unida, uh, were persons who were dissatisfied with the Democratic Party. It was too soft. We didn't do enough for the Chicano community. What I do know is that to answer your question, to attempt to answer your question, because that's a difficult question, is that it was young people. It was young people that were really sort of the base of Raza Unida, who were going to become future voters and would just turn voting age. It was those persons uh, who were the base of Raza Unida, while it was older persons who were being slated for positions, the base was young, was the youth. And so um, to attempt to answer that very difficult question, right? Uh, yeah, we have to galvanize young people. The persons who are not committed and swayed by the two-party system. Persons who won't find it difficult to right, right, deconstruct that system. Some of us are already too caught up in it. Right? So we have to get the young persons, the new thinkers, to come up with radical ways, radical methods for securing equality. Radical methods. So that's a very difficult question to answer. Anybody? I like how you mentioned about uh, Chavez and his religion, and, and you know, and that we had a speaker I think it was last week, and she I forget her name, Doctor. Oh gosh, I can't remember now. Um, but she uh, was talking. Oh, it was uh, Lillian Barger. She was talking about how the leftists, the religious left, and stuff about social justice, and she was talking about how most civil movements. Are, are sparked by the religion and stuff. And so um, it's almost like they, it ties into that because it's such a, a big movement. And I think it, it should be recognized, it's talked about. So I guess my question is why aren't some, why isn't somebody taking this to the, the education board to where it is being taught in school? It, there, there are efforts. There are. As we speak, there are efforts to uh, provide a more equitable history, a more inclusive history. The effort's been there for years now. Uh, there's been some successes, some setbacks, uh, but uh, there's been another push, right? Uh, another effort to uh, craft this history and get this history in the books. So yeah, it, it is happening. It is okay. happening. It's happening at multiple levels. It's slow, uh, it's, it's, but it, the persons who are doing this are in it for the long haul. So it is happening, and ultimately we will get there. But my fear is by the time we get there, then we have to do it all over again for another group in another class. And so the, the, it'll be something that we have to do continuously uh, until we move past sort of this great male history uh, and great white male history. We have to, that, that's the issue. Uh, but it, we're getting there, so we're, we're chipping away at it. very quickly that, um, you know, given our political climate now, um, you know, it, it's interesting to have this kind of conversation. Uh, it can very easily, quickly turn into a conversation about immigration and undocumented peoples uh, in the United States. Uh, and um, it, it, I, was, I was mentioning the, the Reagan administration. Uh, and how it was very sort of anti-union and anti-boycott. Anti but it was actually very pro-immigrant during this period. And it's, it's, it's interesting to sort of see the evolution of the Republican uh, political organization and the Democratic organization, which was actually opposite, right? Kind of anti-immigrant in many instances, mainly because of the influence of Chavez and the Lord's Webinar. But you would see, right, when you sort of think about in today's uh, 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 political climate, most of the workers uh, who are in those fields are still native born workers, but quickly growing are undocumented workers. And so it's, it's, we have to have that kind of conversation as well and think about the kinds of peoples, because it isn't just citizens that qualify as people, as humans. It's people who qualify as people. 
and it's humans. Regardless of where they come from, so think about that as well. Again, when you become a conscious thinker about the food you put in your body, I'm not asking you to be healthy, eat how you're gonna eat. I'm asking you to think about, well, where do these ingredients come from? Right? From your mustard to the sesame seed, where does that stuff come from? Well, it comes from the hands of persons who are in those fields, black, brown, native born, foreign born, English speaking, Spanish speaking, Catholic, Jew, Gentile, you get what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for asking me those questions. I have one last question. Yes, please. For you. Um, I know th during history, I know that the United States is um, addicted to cheap labor. It doesn't matter what the race is, addicted to take advantage of the races, expect them to come and do the job and they keep them out of here. Uh, with the knowledge that you have in um, your time in college, in university, would you say that do we have any um, opportunities to have uh, probably immigration reforms in the future, like we did with the amnesty in 1985, 1986 with uh, Ronald Reagan? Yeah. Would that be? Do you think it is possible to change the minds of um, all these social uh, political groups and uh, parties that? They, they were like pretty much uh, expecting to do something, but what would you think? Do you think will that be possible in the future? I'm, I'm optimistic and I think it is possible. I think anything is possible. Uh, and I think serious reform, uh, reform that has sincere motives is possible. And in fact, that's what I'm looking for. Because uh, I, I know it's possible because we were there before. We've done it before. Right. And uh, so I know we can do it again. And so I, I understand that um, I, mean, I mean, sometimes, I mean, I, I get it. It's fighting work, right? These, these sort of lead to, remember people used to fight with this? These lead to fighting, right? And I get that, I get that. Uh, but I know that uh, ultimately, right, as we sort of go through waves. Right? And I sort of see that with every economic recession, you know, anti-immigrant sentiment seems to skyrocket. We need, we need someone to scapegoat. And they become a very easily scapegoated kind of population. But yeah, we were there in the 80s. Was it 82, 83? Uh, and I don't, I don't see it as possible as getting there again. Um, it might not be easy, but I, I'm hopeful. Okay. Thank you again. I appreciate it.